At least three people have been killed and dozens missing following the collapse of a 21-story incomplete building in the Koi area of Lagos. Rescue efforts have continued overnight. A rise correspondent at Ifemia Kisoya was at the scene of the downed building and sent this report. It was the first day of a brand new week in a brand new month. But just before 2 p.m., in the highbrow area of Ikoyi, Lagos, tragedy struck. At around 2 o'clock, this building came down. Originally, it was 20 stories high. We're not sure of the 21 stories high. We're not sure of the cause of this collapse, but it has, of course, come down, and it's come down with people in it. While we were on ground, at least one person was pulled out of the rubble. The person is feared dead. That has not been confirmed. The body was turned over to emergency ambulance services. But as you can see here, the recovery operation is still in its early stages. On the grounds here are people who were at work, literally constructing this building when it came down. The gentleman just to my side here, was at work on this building, saw it come down, is obviously a survivor himself. You can see that he is muddied with the rubble, also has a bump on his forehead from the impact. Sir, please tell us what happened just before, what were you guys doing just before the building came down? We start hearing fabric, something was just fabric. Before we look, all of us, what we did there, we, we look outside, we can't see anything again. But what we are seeing, we know that this 21-story building is collapsing down, and we, we rescue ourselves to the, the other side. And more than 50 people was inside this 21-story. The other the site where they are calling for school say, was inside there right now, say, like we are seen talking, but all in flame. This incomplete 21-story high building came down, trapping at least 50 people, most of whom are feared dead. Reportedly among them, the owner of the building, dubbed 360 Degrees Towers on Gerard Road, Femi Oshibono. It's believed he saw the development as the apple of his eye. Three high-rise buildings offering luxury, residential and commercial property. But even in its early stages, the process of building it faced a share of difficulties an engineering firm reportedly leaving the project earlier than planned and claims the structure had not been fully approved by the Lagos state government. You can hear the people on ground are not very happy. The gate leading to this building, Boston, has been closed, has been locked, and that has restricted the ability for emergency services to enter this ground. Complaints about the delay in getting responders to the scene wavered with the arrival of personnel and equipment. And when state authorities were present on ground, they decided its civilian response needed support. Moments later, the military was deployed. Their arrival prompted the departure of many of the men who had been on the ground from the outset. With dozens of people still trapped in and under the rubble, rescue efforts continued. Some of the people pulled from the wreckage were still alive, albeit unconscious, but most of them were dead. This person's body was shattered by the impact of the collapsed building, their body removed from the debris in pieces. As day became night, more excavator machines were deployed. Ambulances, other emergency personnel and bystanders lined the streets. The search and rescue operation is expected to continue overnight and well into Tuesday. And while that continues, hope for finding more survivors perseveres despite the odds. And in between that search must also be an effort to discover what caused this incomplete 21-storey building to come down in the first place. Who or what is responsible? Could it have been avoided? Adefemi Akinsanya, Arise News, Ikoi, Lagos. Wow, Tundu, I, I don't even know how to process this. Yet another very sad day. Yet another one. It happens too frequently. Literally almost every year, there's mm. some kind of building collapse. And right now, as we speak, we don't even know the, the number of fatalities. We're still being told what's happening. Even if no life was lost, as happens sometimes, it's always a disaster. And now look at this kind of tragedy. You recall, I think it was in 2016, that there were over 30 people that died mm. in a building collapse. And what efforts have been made by the state government since then? Mm. I remember reading about how you have to have a certificate of fitness, you have to have a certificate upon completion, 
that they're supposed to inspect? Was any of this done? All of that is going to be looked into. If there were um, permits that were meant to be granted and they were not granted and the work carried on, which um, Femi alluded to in her report, we're going to need answers about that. And she also alluded to the fact that uh, Proes um, Engineering Limited in February, their MD, Murtala Olawale, wrote to Femi Oshibono of um, Fourscore Limited, who reportedly was at that site when the mm. collapse happened. And, you know, we haven't had any verified updates on his whereabouts and his safety. Wrote to him saying that he could only vouch for the first and second building and the third building up onto the fourth floor. And henceforth, they're basically washing their hands of the whole situation. This was back in February. What Was there no whistleblower that alerted the authorities that this kind of exchange of correspondence has happened to go and check the building to ensure that things are as they ought to be? Was it a situation, I'm also aware that the Lagos State Government has um, tried to institute legislation to police the affairs and the conduct of property developers in this state. Yes. What exactly is happening with that? All of these questions need to be answered and it's just so sad that life, lives have to be lost before action is taken. For me, the sad part, Tunder, is we don't learn. Yeah. And I am not a prophet of doom, but we are just months or years away from another building collapse because the problem is structural. At first, let me pick out the first structural problem. It took over two hours to get the first respondents there yesterday. Anytime we have an incident like that, people will clog around the area, not give people the chance to come evacuate people or save their lives. Our response time, low. First lesson. If you check the last building collapse, the one that happened on Lagos Island, that children were killed, the same problem we had. Two, so, we don't have adequate trauma centers being set up as we speak in different localities, even getting across to the families of people that might be trapped in those buildings. Yes. Three, a proper inquest and directory of what might have gone on. I hear a lot of things. I spoke to Murtala Olawale yesterday. Probably he should still grant a rise and interview today. And that letter, he confirmed that letter. What was done afterwards by the authorities? How was, you know, the, the, the provision given for him to continue? Where people stopped from checking the building? What, who inspected the material he used for the building? Who was the material engineer? So many questions. Did the building even have insurance at so all? So many questions. Tundu, we will have another building collapse. I don't want to be a prophet of doom. And we'll ask these questions again until something changes. All right, thank you guys so much. That's all our news headline. We'll take a short break now. When we return, we'll have Michael Wilson at this one, Mara, Aaron Akerjala. Give us updates on global business, COVID-19, and spot tips across the globe. Stay with us. Welcome back to the Morning Show here on Arise News. Moving on to Global Business Update, Michael Wilson joins us now from London. Good morning, Mr. Wilson. Good morning. Uh, mixed trade as far as Asia-Pacific markets are concerned, but the standout is the Royal Bank of Australia, uh, which kept, while well, kept its interest rates at this record low of 0.1%, it did indicate that technically um, it's tightening its look um, on inflation. Um, it, I, I won't go into the details of it, just that really is the headline about it. And actually, uh, that is sending a signal to all central banks. We're going to be looking at the Fed and the Bank of England later in the week, obviously. Um, Hong Kong's Hang Seng paired gains. Um, Shanghai stocks uh, down marginally. Japanese stocks slipped after that uh, election-led surge yesterday. Um, it's China's Singles Day today. Now, this is a historic thing. It's the biggest shopping event, or it's turned into the biggest shopping event um, in the world. Um, it started off, as its name suggests, with uh, students, single, single students uh, shopping, males mainly. Uh, now, of course, it extends across everybody. Uh, however, um, there's a lot of scrutiny, as you know, as far as Alibaba and JD.com uh, is concerned. I mean, these are the big online uh, shopping sites. And uh, the incumbents are also saying, or all the rather other analysts are saying that those incumbents will have to be taking on further competition from people. Um, 
JD and Alibaba are emphasizing what they describe as inclusivity and sustainability, as well as aligning themselves with President uh, Jinping's uh, priorities of a common wealth for everybody. Just to tell you how big it is, though, Singles Day is bigger than Black Friday and Cyber Monday in the United States combined. So it's a big big event. As far as the United States is concerned, um, stock futures slightly higher, more records yesterday, but only just eking out gains, basically. There's a lot of investor movement, a lot of things to look for this week, which we were talking about yesterday, FOMC meeting uh, tomorrow, Bank of England meeting tomorrow, decision announced um, on Thursday as normal. Um, just have a look, though. It's, well, I was having a look anyway. It's some of the detail underneath the figures yesterday. Manufacturing prices rose from 85.7 to 81, uh, sorry, 285 from 81 in, in, in terms of uh, percentage price. It's saying that pricing power for goods sold remains strong. And that's something which the US earnings season has told us. In other words, those inflationary pressures that we've often talked about are still there. Let's turn our attention to Scotland in this country and COP26. World leaders, this is the first major decision of promised to end deforestation by 2030. The Queen has said we need to rise above politics for the sake of our children. More than 100 world leaders have agreed to reverse deforestation by 2030. This is the, the first major deal of the summit. This concerns uh, Brazil particularly. Experts welcomed the move. A previous deal in 2014 didn't work out, so seven years old. On and so on we're hoping that it actually does another big one now this 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 probably will make you smile slightly uh, but india targeted 2070 for net zero emissions now all right it's not much and it's and it's a long way away from where most people are looking at which is 2030 however it is the uh the third largest user of coal in the world so that actually that's quite a, a promise from narendra modi um all china did and this was of course um, the president is not attending COP26, so this was a written statement. He's called for countries to take strong actions, as he put it, as far as climate change is concerned. Uh, China is the world's largest emitter of carbon. Um, India is the third largest carbon emitter. So decent, act decent uh, targets. I would have thought relatively realistic from India, but I could be wrong in this. But that, that's, that's my take on it at the moment. Uh, Joe Biden talks about in an age where this pandemic has made so painfully clear that no nation uh, can. It's wall itself off from borderless threats. We know that none of us can escape, escape the worst, uh, the worst that w which is to come. And the UK's Boris Johnson, the Prime Minister of the UK, said that uh, humanity has long since run down the clock on climate change. It's one minute to midnight. Okay, that's, uh, that, with that cliche, let's move on to the EU, uh, and the EU is holding last-ditch talks to try to resolve the UK-France fishing uh, dispute. Apparently, it's in solutions mode at the moment. Uh, the, the Premier Macron has said that he will uh, hold off uh, any kind of sanctions to allow discussions to take place. Um, remember that this is a president of France who is actually facing re-election next year. And uh, he feels as though finding some British fishermen um, is going to help him on his way back to the Elysee next uh, May. We'll see about that. Uh, one of the UK steelmakers um, has been, uh, steelmakers generally, apparently, have been left behind. You remember me telling you yesterday that the the US had agreed uh, to drop tariffs um, with the EU and so on, which Trump actually imposed. That's now gone. However, it doesn't extend to Britain, and Britain is complaining that, uh, that they've, been, they've been left behind. We talked a little yesterday about Barclays and Jess Staley, the chief executive. Um, he's gone because of uh, uh, alleged links with, uh, with the disgraced financier Jeffrey Epstein. Uh, Barclays, though, th never mind the legality of it, what the reason I'm drawing your attention to it is that it actually actually casts a bit of a spectre over Barclays' um, uh, investment banking ambitions, um, because that's what Staley was beginning to move Barclays towards, and it really is a setback as far as Barclays' business is concerned. Um, right, so enough of that. Oil uh, continues a challenging week, basically. OPEC meeting on Thursday, Brent crude up to about 84, but it's still 80. It's sort of creeping around in that range now, uh, and gold finally rising on a weaker uh, US dollar as it tends to do. So it's, it regains some losses overnight, but it's not gold, it's not really moving anywhere. That is your global view, ladies and gentlemen, this morning. Right, Michael, uh, two quick things real quickly. India says uh, they are targeting 2070. Uh, they also want developed nations to put some money out for them. I ask, where would developed nations get the money from? Even the UK, 
uh, has to put a tax on its citizens to be able to achieve net zero. And India, that is coal country, heavily dependent on coal, is saying 2070, I uh, want to be some form, of, have some form of carbon neutrality. That's one. Number two, you talked about Macron. Macron is fighting so hard now to show that he's a nationalistic leader because of a certain rise in the right-wing movement in France of uh, an Algerian French immigrant called Eric Zemmour that has been doing well in the polls. Will Macron be able to cut it? Will Brussels be able to bring a deal to the table between the fishermen in England and in France? Okay, let's do, let's do the, the fishing thing first. So Macron faces Eric Zemmour, you're quite right there, the, the, the right-wing journalist, although the threat of that is more on paper than it has, and, and he hasn't declared yet. Neither has uh, Marine Le Pen, that's the other right-winger who is opposing him, she hasn't declared yet either. Um, w Brussels, I feel, from what I'm reading about it, is very irritated by France's attitude towards, uh, towards British fishermen. Uh, the, the British are saying that they have granted, and I'll give you the figure, I think it's 1657 licenses, and the only licenses it hasn't granted are those fishermen who cannot prove that they were fishing in those waters before Brexit actually happened. That's, that's the British point of view. So Monsieur Macron has very, um, very graciously decided to step aside to allow our Lord David Frost to go to Paris to discuss this further. But as I understand it, these talks are sort of in solution mode. And I would stress what I was saying yesterday, this is nothing to do with Brexit. This is nothing to do with anything recent. These discussions have been going on. These problems have been going on for a long, long time. Um, you can take it back to Napoleon if you really want to, but let's not bore everybody with a history lesson. But it, it's, it's always, there's always been this problem. And the British fishermen themselves and the French fishermen themselves are saying, sit us down, let us, go, let us, let us try to agree something which is mutually beneficial. Politics is getting involved in this. The fishermen are saying, we don't want politics involved in this, we just want to get to a solution. I, th I think that's, that, that's fair enough. As far as India is concerned, I could be wrong. I think that 2070 is probably quite realistic as far as they're concerned because they are the third world's largest carbon emitter. And as you know, they do depend on coal. As far as grants to help them prepare for that, well, that's something they would need to negotiate. I, would, I, I mean, I, I have no, no idea about how those kind of geopolitics work. Personally, I wouldn't be in favour of sending grants to India, given that um, they, they also are involving themselves in the space race and I, I really feel as though you know Modri should be getting to where his expertise is his expertise in business that's his background get back to it and 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 get get India approaching these 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 carbon climate targets All right Michael just one question for the road pension fund issues in the UK a couple of academics have come out to say that the how the economy is playing out should not affect the pension because there's a big effect coming up on the pension with inflation rates and the likes. And Janet Yellen is also saying in America that inflation is COVID-based, that things will pan out well after COVID starts to fritter out. Is she telling the truth or she doesn't have her hands on uh, the subject matter? I have no idea what Janet Yellen thinks, to be honest. I mean, I would have, that, that was what I was trying to point out in the early part of my report, that the small print within the figures, the ISM manufacturing index yesterday, showed that inflation is not transient and it, and it is underlying things. So if you look at what the, the figures actually say, then Janet Yellen is not quite right. As far as academics are concerned, I mean, academics are ten a penny, aren't they? They're a bit like economists, really. You can you get them anywhere, you can get them to say anything. As far as they are, as far as I, I see it right now, that we are going to get some sort of a decision on Thursday from the Bank of England about raising interest rates. And rising interest rates is the last thing that the UK economy needs. But it, it may be that they're acting too quickly. That, that, that would be my take on it. And that, that appears to be what the markets are saying. Academics may disagree. Good luck to them. Thank you so much, Michael. Really appreciate you. We'll take updates on COVID-19 pandemic. I just want more is here to do a great job as always. And it's so great to have you. Thank you so much, Rafai. Good morning, Rafai, and good morning, Tundum. Morning. morning. Well, the world has... Morning, guys. The world has passed another grim milestone with the pandemic. More than 5 million people have now died from COVID-19. And that 
in the space of two years, almost two years since the pandemic was declared, according to the Johns Hopkins University. But the WHO estimates that the actual figures could be almost three times higher than health uh, experts and governments are quoting uh, from around the world. While it took the, the world a year for the debt toll to hit 2.5 million, the first 2.5 million, hear this. The next 2.5 million deaths have been recorded in the space of eight months as the highly contagious Delta variant spread around the world. Now, health experts and scientists also believe that vaccines have slowed the death rate. The milestone comes amid warnings from health officials that cases and deaths in some places are rising in the first time in months. Some countries have seen their highest cases and deaths since the uh, beginning of this pandemic. Now, a further breakdown, let's see where this numbers are coming from. Uh, more than half of the COVID-19 deaths reported were in the United States, Russia, Brazil, Mexico, and India combined. Uh, when it comes to regions, South America accounted for 21% of all reported deaths, and that's the highest percentage as a region. And when uh, we look closely at that region, most of the cases came from Brazil. Now, the United Nations Secretary General, Antonio Guterres, has been speaking on this milestone. In a statement, he says, and I quote, the devastating milestone reminds us that we are failing much of the world, while the wealthy countries are rolling out third doses, uh, only about 5% of people in Africa are fully vaccinated. And he says this is a global shame. Well, let's look at some of the other statistics provided by the Johns Hopkins University. Since 2019, there have been over 247 million infections. And at the moment, some 6.9 billion doses of coronavirus vaccines have been administered. And here in Nigeria, the NCDC is reporting 90 infections and two deaths in its latest, latest data release. A breakdown from uh, the seven states and the federal capital territory Abuja, responsible for the latest tally, shows that Lagos is actually reporting a backlog of cases from the 31st of last month. Vaccination also continues in Nigeria. Uh, only 2.8% of the total eligible persons targeted are now fully vaccinated in Nigeria. Meanwhile, aiming to vaccinate 2 million eligible citizens in the next 60 days. Guys in the studio, this is your state. The Ogun State government has issued an ultimatum to unvaccinated residents to get their jobs or be barred from government offices, schools, markets, and even public transport. Governor Dakwa Abiodu issued a threat during the launch of the state's COVID-19 max vaccination, vaccination campaign yesterday. Now, this exercise in collaboration with the NPHCDA will see the number of vaccination sites increase from 131 to 509 sites. It will also include some private facilities across Ogun State. At the moment, a little above 313,000 people have received at least a dose of vaccine in the state, while another 153,000 have been fully vaccinated in the southwest state of Nigeria in Ogun. And finally, away from Nigeria, in Russia, President Vladimir Putin is considering calling in the army to help to build field hospitals for COVID-19 patients as Russia battles a surge in infections that has led to a nationwide uh, shutdown of workplaces. Uh, President Putin actually made the remarks while speaking to his defense minister, Sergei Shogu, and other top brass. Russia has reported today uh, for a third consecutive time over 40,000 infections daily. But guys. Right, I guess why that story about Russia and um, Putin calling in the army mm. only buttresses your first point about the fact that we did pass that five million casualties milestone a long time ago because people just are, well, some countries don't come forth. They're quite reticent about their data, about accurate data. There are all kinds of black holes, all kinds of misinformation. And it's so tragic that this has happened and continues to happen. I just I want you to know that I'm still in denial that this pandemic is going on. I, I cannot believe this has befallen the mm. world. And so many people have died. I mean, the most, I, I suppose, 
reputable dashboard so far in the world that people usually um, refer to is the John Hopkins University. And even in the last 28 days, there have been so many cases, over 11 million cases and almost 200,000 deaths. Okay, I better not round up because when we're talking about death, I'll be specific. 197,116 deaths in the past 28 days alone. We really are living through a nightmare. And I always have to just stress that point. It's really quite traumatic. A collective nightmare, that is. Indeed. And with regards to our Ogun state, <laughs> well, the government can really <laughs> declare whatever they want to. The courts are the ones that are going to have their say mm -hmm. in the end, as we saw with Edo state, as we are promised that we will see with the federal government. You'll recall that SGF boss Mustafa said from um, December 1st, civil servants must present a vaccine, proof of vaccination or a negative COVID test. December 1st, but that is going to be challenged in court because in some minds it's a challenge to people's fundamental human rights. So it's the courts that will have to balance that out in the end. So we'll see what happens there. Rather than use force, mm -hmm. how about incentivize them? How about take the vaccine on a roadshow? I don't see a lot of campaigns about this vaccine enough in the media. How about sell this vaccine to people again? We know the importance. We need to stay safe. But you see, you might have something that is beneficial to people. If you don't sell it to them, how do you win them over? Mm -hmm. And when you use force sometimes, it just shows that, hey, that's what they've been saying. So I think what the Ogun State government should do, and Nigerian government, incentivize people. Incentivize them for taking the vaccine. Not just say, okay, it's available and all of that. Do a roadshow on the vaccine. Tell people to take it. It is good for them. Tell them the benefits. Or give them Dr. Abati's jollof rice. Give them jollof rice. Give them pepper soup. Give them amala. Mm -hmm. Engage mm -hmm. with them. <laughs> Tell yeah. them this is why we want you to take it. Let them get on board. Mm -hmm. Because once they get on board, they will take it. Secondly, mm -hmm. when I saw the report about passing the 5 million milestone, of deaths. I feel yeah. very sad. But before I reel out my anger and my rants, I want to take our time to thank all the scientists that work so hard mm. and put the mRNA technology in place to get us a vaccine in record time. And I want to thank all the scientists that are still working so hard, wherever they might be around the world, to ensure that we get more vaccines. I hear Valneva has got a vaccine out. Novavax just passed some trials. They've been authenticated in Indonesia. Yes. You know, the couple mm -hmm. out of Germany uh, that own bi BioNTech, the great work they've done, the scientists out of Merck, and all the scientists around the world, you know, for allowing the strength and character and the understanding of purpose mm -hmm. come true for them, that we must indeed fight this pandemic. After doing that, I want to call out two mm -hmm. leaders specifically. A certain former army captain in Brazil called Jair Bolsonaro and a certain real estate developer called Donald J. Trump. The latter was former president of America. In all of this, politics meant so much to him more than the lives of people. He could have saved a lot of Americans. And the painful part was after he came down with COVID, he took the vaccine in private in January and didn't encourage his supporters to go get the vaccine. I'm sure if he gets the chance to sit down and look back at his life, he will think of his actions. And Jair Bolsonaro, that the prosecutors in Brazil has, has been pointed to be the reason for the death of close to 600,000 people with negative information when he's supposed to stand tall. Like we analyzed here rightly the other day with Dr. Abati, that yes, nothing might be done to him. But I think at some point he will get a chance with his conscience. And I think maybe, just maybe, the Brazilian people will show him how they feel in the elections. I'd missed all of this too. I'd like to say a big shout out to a great woman on Amazon, the leader of New Zealand, that did everything possible to protect her nation and her people. In all of this, 
They are heroes, they are villains. But for the success stories, humanity <clears throat> prevailed. Mm. For the villains, and humanity the... also prevailed. What side are you on? Well, we're counting down to 30 days where the uh, prosecutor general in Brazil has to prosecute President Jair Bolsonaro or see the senators uh, go to the ICC as they promised. Uh, they said they would go to the ICC. Or they have also said they will go to the Supreme Court directly. Should the prosecutor general, who is... Um, you know, hired by the president, not take any action. So we keep an eye for Brazil. Thank you yes. so much, Adesso. Thank well, you so much. Out of time. Okay. Yeah, and we hope something is done. Okay, you had comments to make about Jai. Just briefly, I'm never going to believe that he's not going to end up at the ICC until I actually see it. Then I will mm. let go of that dream because an example needs to be made of that man. Absolutely. All right, thank you so much for that. Thank you, Adesso.